Let's turn the pages of our Bibles to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can keep your finger there. We will be moving back and forth, but we'll be camping in that passage. Now, this was one of the messages that preached, and we, we have touched on it before, but it's one of the messages which are preached at the African Pastors Conferences. Um, I did, I did Bochabella and Bloemfontein last year. Same theme. Then um, Zimbabwe and now Malawi um, this year. And the theme for this season of the APC is the defining features of a biblical church. The defining features of a biblical church. And those who are familiar with the APC, there are usually nine sessions, and the tenth session is um, a Q&A, a question and answer. And it's to reach pastors, as we've said before. On this continent of ours, we have, from our research in Mukanyo, over two million pastors. And less than 10% have any kind of formal training. And some of you are familiar with my thesis concerning um, the APC, what we've been able to gather in all the years of hosting it here, and also um, being on a speaking tour for the past four years. Here's what's come to me again and again, and I've relayed this to the, to, to the, to the team in Midrand, where the headquarters of the APC is situated. Probably 80% of the men and women involved in these ministries teach the gospel that they teach because it's the only gospel that they know. So when you see a guy screaming and shouting and just doing motivational speaking, the majority of people are doing that because that's the gospel that they were introduced to. That's all they know. So they copy that and do the same. And the reason why you may wonder and be amazed as to why the Bible in some of this congregation is nothing but a decorative tool and rarely alluded to or employed or expounded properly is because, again, the gospel I'm making quotation marks, the gospel and the form of church that they've been introduced to doesn't have those things. So it's lacking. So the majority of these people are not will, being willfully deceptive or being deceitful. It's just what they know. So when you come along and you engage them biblically, they feel you are attacking Jesus and the gospel. Hence the resistance that we have sometimes encountered. And even here locally, with a lot of the pastors we're working with, praise God, we've built up a network here of 37 churches in the Matcha Big Area. Actually, not just the Matcha Big Area, as far as Seneca, Bethlehem, and now we're even in the Northwest, what we've, we've set up what we call the, the Free State Gospel Coalition. And we're seeing changes. We're seeing people being challenged. And we thank God where we've seen pastors confessing at conferences that they're not born again. Where we've seen women pastors saying, I need to hand my church over to a man. Not because we've battered them into that, accepting that, but because we've simply opened Scripture that says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications of a pastor elder is he, the masculine pronoun, must be a man of one woman. And so on and so on. And you would think, what should be basic ecclesiology? Ecclesiology is the doctrine of how we do church, put simply. Just a fancy word. But a fancy word that sounds good. Ecclesiology. Some of the things 
that they should know they do not know. In Malawi, in Karonga, the third conference further up north, by the way, a beautiful country, I'll be talking about this next week. We had 15 at that, conferences, at that conference, and the chairman of the fraternity said right at the end in front of all of them, and he's a pastor of congregation, and he said, there's so much of this we've never heard. I'm talking about how to arrange, one, one of the topics was pastors and elders as leaders. The concepts there and what we spoke on was foreign to them. They've all got titles, apostle, bishop. Some, some were shocked that there was really nothing special about the word bishop. It just means overseer. Episcopos just means overseer. And it's challenged, why don't you call yourself, I'm overseer, so-and-so. It just sounds better if you say, I'm bishop. But the point is this. And what we do, we make sure we do not mock, we do not, we're not condescending, they're pastors like ourselves, and we engage them. And, in, and in, in Zomba, when you see a grown man with tears in his eyes, saying, please help us. He's a pastor of a congregation, and not a small one. Please help us. Our people need this. And now and again, you hear confession the first time I heard this one was in 2016, 2016, in Livingston, in Zambia, when about 100 men were gathered at this Presbyterian church we're using, and mostly like my older guys, maybe late 30s, 40s, 50s, and so on. So all the, we got all these young pastors out there who are now apostles and prophets. We can't, listen to this, he said, we can't compete with them. Because if we say there's no such thing as prophets and all of these things, if we don't also say the same thing, our people will leave our congregation and go to these congregations and we would lose people. And we saw that again this year in Malawi. What in effect some of them were saying is, can you help us, in fact one of them actually verbalized it this way, can you help us in how we transition to doing this properly and preaching rightly. Because if we were to preach some of these things rightly, we will lose people and they will go to the other churches. But how do we make sure we don't lose people? And the truth was, there was no soft answer. The response was, preach Christ, preach the, preach the truth. We're not to appeal to worldly means or underhanded ways we are to preach Christ. And two of our sessions, one was called A Church Must Be Christ-Centered and Word-Centered, and the other one was Gospel-Driven. And I'm bringing those two together this morning as we look at this passage in 1 Corinthians. You see, because our worship, all that we do, must tell a story. Our worship must tell a story. And I'm not just talking about our corporate worship when we gather here to, together as a group. But our life must be worship. The way we spend our time, the way we use our money, the way we speak, the way we dress, all of these things must express the gospel. So our worship, our life must tell a story. The question is this, what story is your worship telling what story are we telling because the underlying assumption of this message this morning is that the structure of our liturgy liturgy is just a fancy word for the form of our worship our liturgy carries meaning and Christian liturgy should communicate clearly the message of the gospel. Whether we intend to or not, our worship patterns, the way we live our lives, always communicate something. If you're at work or in school, university, going around time, doing sh town, doing shopping, here's the thing, 
your life as a walking as a walking advertisement for Christ communicates something. Whether you intend it to or not, it says something. If you're standing around a bride, what are, how are you speaking? Where does your confidence lie? What do people see in you? What do they hear in you? Is it screaming gospel? Or is it screaming your politics? Is it screaming your color? Is it screaming your education? Is it, is it pointed to anything else other than your confidence in the person and the work of Christ? Church, we should allow gospel purposes to shape our worship, to shape our lives. And this is talking about both the content and the structure of our worship. And I think I want to do more with the contents this morning. So, the question is this, church, what influences our worship? What speaks into our worship? What informs our worship? What informs our life? Who is influencing your life at this point? Is it Beyonce? Who is influencing your life? Is it the ANC or the EFF? Or DA? Is it your culture and your tradition? Sadly, much is done in the church that cannot be called Christ-centered, word-centered, or gospel-driven. Because instead of reading the Word of God, singing the Word of God, preaching and teaching the Word of God, and fellowshipping through the Word of God, we sadly have appealed to and employed worldly means in our worship. But this is not a new thing. In fact, the Apostle Paul had a similar struggle. He faced a similar challenge. See, you see, the thing is this. The reason why we spend the time exhorting you to know the truth, to give yourself to know the truth, the reason why we do many Bible studies, we encourage things that we see as boring, systematic theology, biblical theology, even here at church. I know we're not seminary, but the point is this. These are things we should know, commit ourselves to, surrender ourselves to. Because without it, if you don't know how the truth smells, how it feels, how it tastes, you will be susceptible to every kind of deception out there. I cannot, and we cannot show you every instance of deception or false teaching. But we can show you the truth. And the thing is this, heresy always comes around in cycles and just comes around in different apparel. But it's the same, it's the same problem. Look at this, it's not new. Paul had the same problem. This is 2 Corinthians, the second letter Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Look what he says. In chapter 3, just before this chapter, Paul is talking about how their confidence and their sufficiency is in Christ and in Christ alone. And people have been saying, listen, Paul, theology guru, we know you know a lot. We know like you're an apostle, but you know what, Paul? Your message will go a lot further if you tried X, Y, and Z. You know, Paul, dress a little bit more snazzy. Change your speak. Get your hair cut. Trim your beard. I don't know if what his hair or beard look like, but work with me. You know, Paul, try this, try that. Get the best band in town. Because if you do all of these things, Paul, boy, you'll reach a lot more people, you'll draw a crowd. And Paul says... Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God. I mean, right there at the beginning, Paul stated what we have, what we're doing, who we are, what we have is by God's mercy. In other words, it's not something generated by us. We have this ministry not because I'm going, mm, what should I do with my life? Mm, let me just make this thing up. Paul saying, no, we have this ministry because of God's mercy upon us. That's why any of this exists. And we forget the reason why we exist. All of this is because God did something. 
God initiated something. Because God walked in the garden and said, Adam, where are you? We do not lose heart. Yes, people aren't listening to us. The churches are filled. People are walking away, etc., etc. We've got these challenges, but Paul says, we don't lose heart. Paul, why don't you lose heart? Paul says, but we have renounced. Look at that, we've rejected, we've let go. What, what have they renounced? Disgraceful. Look at the words he uses. Disgraceful. I love this word, underhanded. That's corruption. That's, in other words, corrupt ways. We've rejected that. We've renounced it. We refuse. That's, that's, that's Paul being resolute. Paul said, we've made a resolution. No matter what, no matter how bad it is, we have chosen. We have made up our mind. We will not, we will not change our minds depending on how the road curves. We have made up our mind. We have resolved. It reminds me of Jonathan Edwards who says, I resolve. It's making up your mind before it happens. Say to yourself, no matter what, we will not do this and we will do this. Paul says, we refuse to practice. Look at that. Cunning. Cunning. You know, shady ways. Or temper. When you tamper with something, what are you doing? You're changing its appearance. You're changing it in its very nature. It ceases to be what it truly is. Tamper with who? With what? God's word. Then it says, but by the open statement of the truth. By the open statement of the truth. This is how we minister. It goes on, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, church, look at this. Oof. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. You know what we call those here at Vulcan Baptist Church? Goats. To goats. People go, well, you know, we, we had like those men at APC, but we're going to lose people. But they're going to go away. They're not going to hang around. Paul says, they're not hanging around because they're goats. They're perishing. They don't see it. It's not, it's not the truth of your preachers that's the problem. The problem is, they're goats. That's why they're leaving. That's why they're going away. That, that's why they're not hanging around. It's veiled to them. In their case, the God of this world, look at this, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul is telling us right there. Remember Ephesians 6? Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual forces. That's what's going on in the background. That's why, that's why they're not accepting, because someone's blinded them. But Paul, is there an answer to this? Let's read on. For what we proclaim, it's not ourselves. It's not me, not Joshua Balaji, not Louis O'Toole. It's not you. It's not any man, except for one man, one special man. Who is that, Paul? But Jesus. Not just Jesus, but Jesus the Christ. Not just Jesus the Christ, but Jesus the Christ as Lord. With ourselves, your servants, of Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Genesis, creation language, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Right there, Paul is saying, this is a God thing. This is something only God does. The reason why you and I are sat here this morning is because God said, let there be light. He spoke creation language and brought forth life. And the point is this. No amount of singing and dancing and entertainment or fancy speech is going to raise dead people. If you don't believe me, take the best band to the graveyard and try it out. No, no. You need God power. 
You need a power that only God can provide. And that comes through Jesus Christ, his son. And when Christians, when Christian worship is word-centered, Christ-centered, gospel-driven, it will always, always produce life. And a word-centered worship, gospel-driven worship, will always be Christ-centered. And this is what we'll consider now. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. From verse 17... And we're referring to the fifth verse in chapter 2. And it reads, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not to words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come com proclaiming to you the testimony did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lost his speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen indeed. What we have here this morning, if you may put a title to this message, is the foolishness of the cross and the wisdom of men. The foolishness of the cross and the wisdom of men. And the central point of all of this we've seen in this passage we just read is verse 18. And what the point Paul is making here is this. He's presented to us two things. One, how the perishing see the cross. And secondly, how those who are being saved see the cross. Both groups of people are seeing the same thing. But both are affected differently. One group are perishing, the other group are being saved. And I want you to know this, people. Church, listen very carefully. Please Never divide people along the color of their skins, where they live, how much money they earn, their education, or anything. The Bible knows of only two categories of people. Those in Adam, those in Christ. Those in God's family, those in Satan's family. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. It's either one of those two. And in verse 17, a step back, we have the purpose of which Paul was sent. So, 
Just before this, Paul is talking about the division in the church. I'm for Apollos. I'm for Kephas. I'm for Paul. I'm for this. I'm for Tom. I'm for Jerry. And they're all like in different camps. But Paul says, listen, that, that's not my main purpose. I've come to preach the gospel. This is the reason for which I was sent. This is the reason for which I was called. And the point Paul is going to make is this. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We find our unity because we're sworn in together in Christ. So whether you're under Paul or Peter or Jim or John, whoever, the point is this, none of those geezers died for you. None of those guys redeemed you. Jesus redeemed you. And that's what I'm about, Paul is saying, about that gospel. Paul says, listen, I didn't baptize any of you. So you can't even make that claim. But he says, he's preaching the gospel. And I want you to notice something. He says, he's preaching this gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom. Did you hear that? Not with refined wisdom. Oh, he knows so much. He's so learned. Paul says, no, that was not, that's not my aim. When I preach the gospel, it's about making sure that Christ is presented clearly, nothing obscuring the sight to the cross. Why, Paul? Why do you do it that way? Why, Paul? Why don't you employ words of eloquent wisdom? Paul tells us, so that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power. If you start adding salt and pepper to the cross, to the gospel, Paul is saying, you empty it of his power. If it ceases to be the cross, if it's adulterated, you are emptying of its power. If you add to it, or you take away from it, or like we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, you are using underhanded ways, tampering with it, employing corrupt methods, you are tampering with it with the cross you're tampering with the gospel you are emptying the cross of its very power and what does Paul mean by that it loses its message the message is lost let's go on look at verse 18 let's go back to verse 18 so Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing to those who reject the salvation of the cross and Paul is saying here, the idea of being saved through the work of a crucified man is foolish. Paul says it doesn't make sense. This is truly folly. How can a crucified man save me? Paul's point is this. What message does a cruel, humiliating, unrelenting instrument of death what message does it have? The problem is this, church. Listen very carefully. We have domesticated the cross. We have domesticated the cross. We have washed it up. We've washed it down. We've sprayed perfume on it. We've wrapped it, painted it. So it may be appealing to people. It's like a tamed lion a tamed lion ceases to be a lion. It loses all his glory and prowess. Paul says, no, this doesn't make sense. And anyone who says it makes sense doesn't get the cross. And we today, I think we've lost the horror of the cross and truly what it is we preach about, what it is we read about, what it is that we sing about, we sing it. There's the power of the cross in the cross in the cross oh that old rugged cross we sing all of this but really what we're singing about is about capital punishment it's like singing about the electric chair or the needle or the hangman's rope in the rope in the rope be my glory ever. 
Oh, that old rugged rope. Does it bring it home? It's ridiculous, isn't it? It is, you laugh because it's ridiculous. The cross is equally ridiculous. The cross is equally ridiculous. That's the point Paul is making. We wear it around our, in fancy gold chains, nothing wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong for you to wear it. Don't say, Pastor said we shouldn't wear gold chains, cross chains. No, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is this. Because we're 2,000 years removed, and we don't live in Palestine today, and we have no clue as to what it was like, we have sanitized the cross and thereby sanitize the gospel message. I want this picture to remain with you. So whenever you preach the cross, you talk about the cross, you sing the cross, I want you to be reminded of the absurdity, uh, absurdity of the cross. Because that's the point Paul is making here. It doesn't make sense, Paul is saying. How a crucified man, or how a hanged man, saves me. And church, if you think you can, with your wisdom and your eloquence of speech and your learning, communicate, as I've said this many times, communicate to people in Velcom today about a Jewish man who died 2,000 years ago. And you think you're clever enough to communicate that truth today, that it makes sense by your power, by your reasoning that you don't understand the gospel. But Paul says, to us who are being saved, the rope is the power of God. That which is ridiculous, which the world laughs at, the world mocks us. That's why Paul says, he makes his boast. What, is, why do you, you see, because we don't understand what Paul is talking about, when he says, I am not ashamed of the cross. In Romans 1.16, we say, Amen, Paul. We don't understand how embarrassing it was for them. In fact, people used to mock the Christians. They used to draw donkey's head on the walls to mock the Christians that they're a bunch of donkeys. You lot are a bunch of donkeys. How on earth do you worship a crucified, a criminal, a man who was condemned and crucified? You're a bunch of donkeys. But Paul says, yes, I'm gladly a donkey and a fool for Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he says similar words there. It's the power of God unto salvation. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Though it is a strange message and regarded as foolish by the perishing, Paul says, but to those who trust in it and are being saved, this message of the cross becomes to them the actual power of God. And there is inherent power in the preaching of the true gospel. Like Paul says, by the open statement of the truth. Because when it is received, the faith, it gives life. The hearing and trusting of the true gospel will bring the power of God into a person's life. Church, we need to understand, preaching high moral standards is not the gospel. Preaching the fatherhood of God of all men is not the gospel. Preaching motivational messages is not the gospel. Preaching, come to Jesus and you'll be rich and never get sick, is not the gospel. Preaching the brotherhood of all mankind is not the gospel. Preaching, be nice to your neighbor, hug your neighbor, hug a tree, is not the gospel. We preach Christ crucified. And in verse 19 to 21, in verse 19 to 21, Paul now contrasts, compares the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. Paul talks about who's the debater of this age? Where's the wise men? Because the world thinks we're foolish. The world mocks God and says, it doesn't make sense. If I was God and people sin against me, I'd just 
stürzt eine, eine, das geht, <laughs> oh. it's amazing how one film transforms something so simple. But I've heard people say this, well, if I was God, atheist, what kind of a God allows this? So they say, if I was God, I'd just make everything okay. Snap, that's it. They don't get it. It continues to confound unbelievers. Paul says, this kind of wisdom is not arrived at through human reasoning. This kind of wisdom, the wisdom of the cross, can never be arrived at through the wisdom of men. It's ridiculous. And that's why those who enter the kingdom are those who are lowly in heart, who humble themselves, who say, I may not understand everything, but God, I submit to you because you are God. Isaiah was called to preach. He sees this magnificent, magnificent vision of Christ high and lifted up. He's transformed. He sees the, the seraphim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The shaking, the trembling, the holiness of God. Isaiah is aware of his sin. And when the Godhead says, Who will go for us? He could do nothing but say, Here I am, send me. You think after that amazing vision and God's commissioning, that he would hear the words, Isaiah, now go. And you preach, and I'm going to bring about a revival. You know what God says? Isaiah, when you preach, I'm going to make sure they don't listen to you. I'm going to make sure they don't see. I remember the first time I read that, I had to like turn the page and like, what? Well, that doesn't sound pretty great. I don't want a ministry like that. God says, he will purposely, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I, in other words, I will confound, I will confuse, I will thwart so that they do not understand. If you think yourself wise, if you think yourself learned, if you think yourself so brilliant and thus find this ridiculous, then the gospel is not for you. Through the foolishness of the message, Paul says, is one truly wise. And Paul says, like I mentioned earlier on, he said to the Greeks and to the Jews, you're trying to, to the Christians there, you're trying to make something of this cross that it's not. Like I said earlier, we, we take the message of the gospel and we try to make it palatable to people who are perishing. And Paul says, why are you doing that? For example, there's a man that wrote a book, The Gospel Driven Church. Um, yeah, I think that's what it's called. Rick Warren, was it? Yeah. The purpose, sorry. The purpose, not gospel, no. The Purpose Driven Church is a terrible book. And I, I say this for the following reason. I remember reading that book the first time and this man goes on to talk about how he went around doing a survey to talk to people what they want to see in the church. What? That's like God asking us, guys, so how do you want to do this? It's ridiculous. We don't ask the world, how do you want to do church? Church is for believers. We welcome unbelievers. We're not to do things that will cause the name of Christ to be blasphemed amongst unbelievers. But churches of believers, we reach out to unbelievers that they may be part of the body of Christ. To disciple them. Non-believers should not be able to fit into our midst. Because what we have is the product and the work of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit alone. If, un if unbelievers can come in our midst and fit in, and be comfortable here, there's a problem. Because this is not arrived at by human reasoning. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's wisdom that doesn't make sense to men. Back to Numbers chapter 21. We read earlier on. 
The people were grumbling, moaning to God. God had provided again and again for them. The God who delivered them out of slavery. And all they could do was moan and complain against God and against Moses. A bunch of ingrates. And God just had enough. Sent snakes into their midst and the snake starts to bite them. Killing thousands. Please take off your Christianese glasses. Put yourself in the scene. You're in the wilderness and snakes are everywhere. And they're biting people. People are dying. You cry out. God help us. Here's what you expect him with human reasoning. That Moses will st- set up a tent. Get the best doctors. Get the, some good herbs. And apply ointment to the snake bite. Wrap it up. and Or sometimes you've got to let it breathe. And then you know they find healing, right? But what do we read? I want you to imagine yourself in that scene. Oi! Martha! Yes! Moses has found a cure. Really, what is it? Well, bring your kid, he's been bitten by the snake, and if he has a look at the bronze serpent, he'll be right. Have a look at what? The bronze serpent. What bronze serpent? Now, Moses put a bronze serpent on a pole, and if you look at it, you're okay. Doesn't make sense. You know what God is doing? God is saying, if you will not accept my wisdom, then I'll treat you as fools. Here it is. Let's see who's wise. Here's your salvation. When you look at that bronze serpent, you'll be saved. Do you know how many people would have died that day because they would have thought it foolish and did not want to look ridiculous? Not look no, you got to look. No, no, that's stupid. No, is, is anybody else? Is anybody else going to look? Let's see what happens with them. In Isaiah fifty-five, verse eight to nine, God says, "For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways," says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Charles Spurgeon put it well. Charles Spurgeon. I recommend him. Charles Spurgeon said this, quote, It is certain that a blind man is no judge of colors. A deaf man is no judge of sound. And a man who has never been quickened into spiritual life can have no judgment on spiritual things. Unquote. God does not think like you and I. The best thing for us, submit to his wisdom. And then in verses 22 to 25, Paul presents to us the triumph of God's wisdom. You see, he says, the Jews demand a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom. Look at it. See, in Paul's day, the Jewish world was looking for a sign. They were anticipating the coming of the Messiah. Specifically, they wanted the sign of a miraculous messianic deliverance. They were not looking for the message of the cross. Their desire for deliverance was not a bad thing. But their rejection of God's way of deliverance was the problem. Let me quote Gordon Fee. On this passage, he says this, Gordon Fee says, quote, their idolatry was that they now had God completely figured out. He would simply repeat the Exodus in still greater splendor, unquote. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for deliverance, but they wouldn't accept the way God was delivering. And what about the Greeks? It's good to seek wisdom, right? The Greeks wanted wisdom. They seek after wisdom. The Greek culture valued the pursuit of wisdom, usually expressed in high academic philosophical terms. The problem was this. They did not value the wisdom expressed in the message of the cross. They did not value the wisdom 
in the cross, their desire for wisdom was not necessarily a bad thing, but their rejection of God's wisdom was. Again, let me quote Gordon Fee on this passage. He said this, quote, Their idolatry was to conceive of God as ultimate reason. Meaning, of course, what they deemed to be reasonable. Unquote. Paul says, the Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. Not the wisdom of men, not philosophy, not motivational messages. We preach Christ. Let me tell you a story. There's once a church, a strong church, once inscribed these words on an archway leading to the churchyard. Over time, two things happened. The church lost its passion for Jesus and his gospel. And ivy, the ivy plant, began to grow on the archway. So on the archway, they had boldly four words. We preach Christ crucified. And the growth of the ivory covering the message showed and signified the spiritual decline of the church. Originally, it said strongly, we preach Christ crucified. But as the ivy plant grew, you know the ivy plant that grows on the walls? As the plant grew and grew, it, all, it started to represent the spiritual state of the church. Soon, one could only read, we preach Christ. And the church also started to preach, Jesus, the great man. Jesus, the moral example. Instead of preaching Christ crucified. And the ivy kept growing and growing and growing. And soon, one could only read, we preach. And the church also even lost Jesus in a message. Preaching religious platitudes and social graces. Let's just be kind to all mankind. Finally, one could only read, we preach. And the church also just became another social gathering place, all about we and not about Christ. And in verse 26 to 29, Paul presents to us God's foolish wisdom and how this is displayed by the people that he has chosen to save. Now, this is, about, now, this is not me calling you names. This is what God says about you and me. Okay? God's wisdom is displayed in the very people he has chosen. Now listen to this very carefully. God is, is, is um, bringing together all things in Christ in the church. He's wrapping up history in Christ in the church. Okay? Now if you are going to do this, speaking humanly, I love you people, but I wouldn't choose you. I'm looking for the best people. But God doesn't work like that. <laughs> Praise God too, isn't it? Because <laughs> a lot of us are able to make it. But look at who God chose. Look at verse 26. This is you and me, by the way. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. So you aren't, you're not wise? Not powerful? Not noble birth? Praise God. How many people tick those boxes? But look, it goes further. Verse 27. But, what, who did God choose? Not you going, oh, let me see. No, no. Three times it says this. But God chose. What did God choose, people? Foolish people. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world 
even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. How about that? That's you and me, low and despised, weak. God is not looking for strong people. God is not looking for wise people. God is not looking for high people. God is looking for the foolish. He's looking for the weak. He's looking for the low and despised. If that's you, welcome. Jesus said, I've not come for the, those who are well, but for those who are sick. And that's why the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 11, waxes lyrical in, in chapter 11, verse 33, when he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. And then in verse 30 to 31, Paul presents to us true wisdom. And that this true wisdom belongs to the believing. I always say to people, if you struggle with a lot of the miracle stories in the Bible, the donkey talking, yeah? Because, you know, donkeys talk. Really, I spoke to one the other day. Donkeys talk. Jonah's story. And all of this. The only way you can actually do stories make sense is through the eyes of faith. But it starts by believing in Christ. True wisdom belongs to the believing. It all starts to make sense. Things drop into place. Paul says there in verse 29, verse 30, sorry, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul says something equally in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, we are those who glory in Christ. We boast in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 9. We boast so that no man can boast. It's the work of God. Absolute work of God. And just before this, in verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So God purposely looks for that which is lowly, that which submits, that which is nothing. And he does something marvelous with it. So that all the glory may be Christ. This is true wisdom. And finally, Paul says, the ministry, all that he does. So because of all of this, Paul bookends it with how he started it in verse 17 and 18. It's foolish. It doesn't make sense. And the only way to minister with something like this or to convey this message is not by your eloquence or your learning but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Look, look at me, chapter 2. Paul says clearly, When I came to you, I chose to know nothing, but all I did was preach Christ crucified. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith, now here's the key, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul is saying, if I came to you in such a way, with something that's beyond your ability, beyond your financial resource, beyond your learning, or whatever else, then your faith would rest in, well, you know, they've got the best band. That's why, they, that's why people have been born again. Paul says, no, it's not about the best band. Your faith can't rest in the best band. Because not everybody can have a best band. Well, they're, they're, they're preachers and eloquent speaker. Paul says, no, no, it's not about that either. Because some people are, are, are brilliant um, preachers as far as knowing the theology of what the Bible says. But they're not fancy of words. They're not clever of words. Not every preacher has that gift. So no, it's not that either. Well, maybe because he's got a degree. Well, no, actually, and that's why the qualification for a pastor elder in the Bible is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. And it only speaks about one ability. The rest is about the character of the man. 
So it's not even that either. So what is it? Paul says, I want your faith to rest in the demonstration of the Spirit and, and power. I want it to rest where it's supposed to rest, in Christ crucified. I don't want it to rest, well, they've got a fancy chapel. Well, you know that PowerPoint, that church, their PowerPoint presentation is just amazing. And you know, they've got all this gadgetry, and the way they use social media, modern media, to communicate things and do all that fancy stuff, and their website, that's just totally amazing. You can download their podcast. Man, that's why the church is filled up. Paul says, no, I'm not rest. Those things are good, but I'm not resting any of those things. No, your faith must rest in Christ crucified. Your faith must rest in that which can only come from the crucified Son of God, in the risen Lord, who is at the right hand of the majesty on high, forever interceding for you. Your faith cannot rest in anything else but him alone. Church, here's some bad news for you, but it's good news. You don't matter. It's not about you. It never was. That's why Paul lost his mind with the Galatians, you foolish Galatians. Who's bewitched you? You didn't start this gig. Why do you think now you can, you can complete this gig? It's got nothing to do with you. It never was about you. And we, as a church, as a congregation, Welcome Baptist Church, listen carefully. We're called to make disciples. And everything we do is around God's word, or you try. It's not about all the riz, the bling, and all of those things. But relationships that are built up through the word of God, through gospel, gospel relationships, and then using that to reach out to disciple others to be part of this glorious body of Christ. It's really very simple. We complicate it unnecessarily. We need to make sure the main thing remains the main thing. You're made in God's image. You're valuable. You have inherent worth because you're made in His image. But do not, never allow yourself to think you are indispensable and people and everything relies upon you. It's something which pastors have to fight weekly. I may spend hours preparing the message, but I'm the fool if I think it's dependent upon my learning and my preparation. This preparation is good, studying is good. All of these things are good. But you see, here's the key. Am I surrendering that to submitting that by bending the knee and acknowledging that God, the power, belongs to you? Are you doing the same? Are we doing this? Show me a church that doesn't pray and I'll show you a church that's relying upon its own power, just riding on its own steam. Show me a church just, just put, depending on all the glitz and glam, and I'll show you a church that's not preaching Christ crucified, but preaching we. We must continue to preach Christ crucified. Like the Baptists, we must point people to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We must move out of the way and not obscure people's sight and vision of the cross. They must see the cross clearly for what it is, a horrible instrument, unrelenting instrument of punishment, of death, filled with blood, where the Savior, the Son of God, was crucified, was dead, was buried, and rose again. They must see him and him alone. God will not share his glory with, any, with anyone else. So let the songs we sing the melody it may be nice, it may be a trendy song, but if it's a vacuous song, empty of the cross, we will not sing it. We welcome skill, but I'm looking for availability above skill. I'm looking for worshippers. Christ is looking for worshippers. God is looking for worshippers. You may be a gifted teacher or speaker or preacher, but if what you're preaching, the content of your preaching, lacks Christ, we do not want it. We want people who are serving. But if your service is about you, and you're not demonstrating the patience of serving other people, allowing low, no matter how long it takes, 10, 20, 30 years, and if people don't get it, you keep serving, 
Because it's not you, about you making people see it, but about when God is ready to say, let there be light. You and I are called to faithfulness, for God to gospel faithfulness. The harvest is not our problem. You will not find in scripture where the harvest is our responsibility. That belongs to the Lord of the harvest himself. And you and I are not the Lord of the harvest. But we are called to gospel faithfulness. The question is, how are we doing that? Let's think about this together, church. Join with us. Think about this. How can we better do this? How do we do church so that it reflects the story that we convey is Christ crucified? That our lives reflect Christ crucified? Everything about us oozes, express, screams, proclaims Christ crucified. Let's pray. Father God, we bow before you at this time as we're reminded through this message, through this passage we've read, not in the cleverness of the preacher's words or, or his learning, but trusting that you are working a work that only you can work, for we want you alone to get the glory. So Lord, we ask you that you would please do a work in our midst that tells the story of the Son of God, the Christ, who is Lord, to tell the story of, that, of the crucified Christ, who died, was buried, and rose again, of him who is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let us tell his story. Let us be those people who depend on your spirit. Let us be those people, Father God, who love one another. Let us be those who are patient with one another, putting each other's interests before our own. Let us be the congregation, Lord, who are dependent upon you for all things. Let us be a congregation who stands behind the cross and not obscuring people's sight of the cross. Let us be those who live perpetually in repentance. Let us be those who would gladly be fools for the message of Christ crucified. Let it please you, Lord, to glorify your name in our midst and through us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.